Justice League was bad. I mean, it was fine, but its fineness makes it bad. In theory, a Justice League movie is awesome. The Justice League is awesome. Batman is awesome. Superman is awesome. Wonder Woman is awesome. They are all awesome. And together, they are even more awesome. And if you saw it, you know why Justice League was not awesome. Boring story, cliche villain, strange casting, dodgy CGI, a constantly changing tone, and just a general lack of anything new. And before I go any further, I want to make it clear that I don't blame anyone for this, it isn't Snyder or Whedon or Affleck's fault. When you look at the list of things one movie was supposed to accomplish, mixed with other studio agendas we don't even know about, and you throw in the personal tragedy Snyder had to deal with while working on this movie, it's a miracle that Justice League is coherent at all. I've always said that the movie making process from start to finish is so chaotic that it's insane that any movies are any good. And even though I have fixes, not only do I have the benefit of hindsight, but I also don't don't have to deal with studio directives. It's a hard job and I'm in no way saying that I'm a better writer than any of these guys. This is just a fun exercise. Now that we got that out of the way, here's what I want to do. I've been thinking about Justice League a lot and I have an outline of what I believe would be the best Justice League movie we could have gotten. It accomplishes everything the real Justice League movie tried to accomplish while making a ton of changes that I believe make a stronger film and a more interesting universe going forward. This even closes up a couple of plot holes from Batman v Superman. Each video in this series is going to be one act of the movie. The second act might be two videos, I'm not sure yet. In the videos, I'm going to describe my version of the movie, talk about why I believe my changes are an improvement over the original film, and talk generally about the three-act storytelling structure and why that's important. Couple ground rules. I need to work with the DCEU we have going into Justice League. This isn't going to follow any of my other videos. Everything happened the same as it does in the movies. Doomsday killed Superman, Lex is in jail, Batman and Wonder Woman know each other. There is no Nando cinematic universe. Number two, I can't add any really important characters to the universe. I'm going to work with minor villains and one slightly major one, but none of the characters in this movie existing will make a huge impact on the future of the DCEU, i.e. no Hal Jordan, Martian Manhunter, Hawkgirl, Brainiac, Darkseid, or anyone like that. Number three, I can't do anything too different with the characters that are in Justice League. They need to end this movie in more or less the same place as they do in the real Justice League. I'm going to do one thing very different differently, which I'll touch on later, but I can't do anything crazy like kill Alfred, as much as I may want to. With that being said, let's look at my version of Justice League. The movie opens with the memorial service. It's been a year since Superman's death, and Metropolis is dedicating a new statue to Superman in the center of the park, where Superman fought Doomsday for a second. Everyone that matters is there, the police, army generals, senators, even the president came to Metropolis for this. It would also be a great place for a cameo or two, Amanda Waller, Rick Flagg, Hopper, tie some of these movies together. Together. And on a nearby rooftop, at a view of all of the cameras and secret service, is Batman. He's watching the memorial from a distance and talking over his headset with Alfred about Superman. They talk about how bad things have gotten in the years since Superman's death. Crime is up, and specifically, metahuman related crime. That's the big idea for this movie. The most interesting part about the death of Superman isn't the death, it's what comes after. How do heroes and villains react? Does anyone try to fill the void left by Superman? Usually, someone tries to take advantage of the situation. How does that work? This movie is just going to be the natural response to Superman's death. Everything that happens is going to happen because Superman died one movie ago. And if you're wondering, well, how does Steppenwolf fit into that picture? The answer is, he doesn't. So anyway, crime is on the rise and Bruce is exhausting himself trying to hold everything together. He feels guilty for being part of Superman's death and now the weight of all this new crime that's popped up since Superman died is on Bruce's shoulders. And that's his arc through this movie. Bruce has to let go of that guilt and believe in people again. The other reason I like the memorial as a jumping off point for this movie is we get to show the public universally loving Superman. We hear speeches from different people he saved, these astronauts, Lois Lane, the president, this guy. We we're gonna set a new tone. People might have had mixed feelings about him before, but after a year of dead Superman, everyone's on the same page. He was great, and boy do we miss him. Kinda like how Lincoln was a pretty divisive figure, but then he was assassinated and we got a little perspective, and now he's on President Mountain in the worst coin. And between Bruce talking to Alfred about all this crime and the speeches about the world without Superman at the memorial, we are doing the first thing you have to do in Act 1. We are setting up the ordinary world. What things look like normally, or at least in the last year. 
here. Supervillain crime is at an all-time high, but Batman is keeping it together by himself. So anyway, the memorial service is interrupted by a man in the crowd who just starts tearing through the rest of the mourners towards the president. Batman springs into action. The police, the army, and the secret service all try to stop him, but this guy just keeps going. And it's revealed that the mystery man is actually Basil Carlo, aka Clayface. If you don't know him, Clayface is a fun Batman villain who is pretty prominent in the Lego Batman movie. He can shapeshift and he's also just like a big mountain of clay. He's great, but he probably won't be a main character in one of these future movies. So let's use him here. Batman stops Clayface. They have a small back and forth. I want Batman to say, you shouldn't be here. And Clayface to say to Batman, well, you're the one that killed him. That'll be explained later. Then they have a big cool fight. This is your act one hook. One pretty common rule of screenwriting is that something big needs to happen in the first 10 minutes of a movie. In Jurassic Park, the cage raptor eats that guy. In Avengers, Loki attacks the base. The real Justice League movie starts with, I honestly can't remember. And I had a discussion about this the other day and looked it up and I've already forgotten it. Say what you will about Batman v Superman, but it starts with what I believe is the best scene in that movie. The Metropolis fight from Bruce's perspective. Like, yeah, it doesn't make any sense because why is anyone staying in those buildings? But it's still pretty cool. Update. Okay, so I looked it up again. And the real Justice League movie begins with the handheld Superman video, but the first action scene is Batman on the roof fighting the parademon. Not super memorable. And then a Wonder Woman scene comes later, but since that has pretty much nothing to do with the plot, it's also pretty unmemorable. This Clayface scene will not only be a lot of fun, but it will also help set the tone for the rest of the movie. So the fight ends with Batman getting an airdrop from the Batwing, kind of like in the Arkham games, of some special grenades that freeze Clayface. And after the fight, Batman notices that Clayface destroyed the new statue, but then he sees a exploded Batarang in the rubble. So maybe Batman destroyed it. He isn't sure. Titles. So then Bruce goes back to the Batcave and meets Alfred. They talk about the fight and how strange it was that Clayface, a bank robber, tried to kill the president. Alfred tells Bruce that Clayface might have been a part of something bigger. There was another museum robbery at the same time as the attack, this time at the Metropolis Museum of Natural History. Maybe Clayface was working with the robbers and it was his job to distract the police and Batman by attacking the memorial. Alfred lets Bruce know that the robber or robbers didn't leave a trace behind, nothing on the cameras, no fibers. The police are still investigating, but it looks like this is more than just a series of random robberies. They are dealing with something different, more complicated than before. So this is your inciting incident, the problem Batman needs to solve. He doesn't know exactly why yet, but Bruce notices that this is a paradigm shift. Something new is happening. The villains are organizing in a way that he hasn't seen before. That's what this movie is about. They talk about what was stolen. Alfred gives Bruce a list and Bruce notices that among other items, the robbers stole an Egyptian artifact similar to the one that was stolen last week. Bruce theorizes that they might be trying to collect all of them for some reason. Alfred jokes, if only we knew an archaeological historian who could help us figure out what they have in common. Alfred wants Bruce to ask Diana, aka Wonder Woman, for help. He says that she could figure this out and also might be able to help Bruce with the bank robbers. But Bruce dismisses this idea. He doesn't want to bring anyone into this. I know when Batman v Superman ended, Bruce and Diana were ready to start the league, but before then and now, public opinion on Batman has shifted. This is one of the first of many retcons in this movie. Retroactive continuity. Making a change to something that already happened, or giving it a new meaning. One thing that we didn't realize during Batman v Superman was that Batman and Superman's fight on the rooftop was recorded. Because of course it would be. Batman puts up the bat signal to get Superman's attention. Batman's been Batman in these movies for 20 years. That would be a big deal. People would notice that. So someone did. And that person was able to record the fight. It isn't super clear, but you can get an idea of what happened on the roof. Batman shoots Superman with kryptonite and then beats the hell out of him. Now we have some actual consequences for the Batman v Superman fight. Batman didn't have anything to do with Superman's actual death, but people see Batman beating up Superman the night Superman died and they stop trusting Batman. Kind of like the ending of Dark Knight. And this really gets to Bruce. Alfred mentions the other metahumans that Bruce found on Lex's hard drive, Flash, Aquaman, and Cyborg. Bruce is against using them too. Especially because, and I can't believe this never comes up in Justice League, some of them are pretty young. Cyborg is probably in his mid-twenties, and Flash seems to be in his early twenties. This Bruce would probably have a problem with working with younger kids, since he doesn't seem to have completely gotten over losing Robin, or at least it's way more interesting if he hasn't. Then we've got even more guilt on Bruce's shoulders, and forming the Justice League is going to be that much harder. And it should be hard, this scene is a crucial bit of the first act. The Justice League is is the adventure. Assembling them is Bruce stepping out of his comfort zone, and traditionally, for whatever reason makes sense, in Act 1 
the hero initially rejects the call to adventure. In this case, it's because Bruce works alone. He doesn't want to bring anyone else into this. Bruce believes it's his burden to bear. And this scene ends with Bruce getting a report of another robbery taking place at the Gotham Museum this time. He's completely out of energy, but Bruce gets in the Batmobile and takes off for the museum. Maybe now we check in with Diana. We can have that same scene from Justice League. I like it now because it reinforces this idea that there's a crime wave happening everywhere. Not just Metropolis and Gotham. Diana is in DC working at the Smithsonian, and she's foiling random bank robberies too. And this might count as a nitpick, not unlike my podcast, mostly nitpicking. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. But in my version of this scene, this guy is someone. One thing I think Justice League really whiffed was the opportunity to add more color to this universe. Like, the DCEU is supposed to feel lived in, more even than the early MCU. When we meet Iron Man, he's just starting out as Iron Man. Same with Thor and Captain America. But we meet a Batman who has been at this for a while. He should have some villains kicking around. Same goes for Wonder Woman. Every time we have a random encounter with a villain, it should be somebody. Like this scene, which I'm cutting anyway, but for example, Batman is just chasing some guy. Why? We have an opportunity for Batman to encounter a villain. It could be one of hundreds of characters from comics, and they go with just some boring guy. Audiences are smart. They catch on quick. You can sub in Mr. Zazz or Riddler or someone, and they'll get it. And you could say, well, maybe they don't know which villains they want to use in future movies. And to that I say, you probably should have figured that out by now. Like, have just a rough idea of who exists and doesn't exist in this universe. Alfred mentions wind-up exploding penguins in this movie, so I guess Penguin exists? Also, the rest of the Suicide Squad, so like, there should be others. This scene should have been Batman and Catwoman. They have rooftop chases, they talk, and the important part, if Batman managed to get what Catwoman stole from her, he might let her get away. She's the one Batman villain who that works with, not some random thug who just shot at Batman. So yeah, this is someone. And yes, technically, I know this could maybe be a character called Alpha from the comics, but since no one noticed, that wasn't enough. And it could literally be any DC villain who primarily uses a gun, but I believe this scene works best with a character called Anarchy. He's a newer Batman villain who is, you guessed it, an anarchist. This kind of terrorism is totally what he would do, and he does symbolize the big idea of this movie. Superman's death led to chaos. Tweet me if you have ideas for other villains to throw into this scene. Twitter.com slash NandoVMovies. I'm a fun follow. Otherwise, exact same scene, but ending with Diana getting a phone call. So we check back with Batman. He's on his way to this museum. He notices that traffic is at a standstill all around the museum. The traffic lights are out. The street lights are out. Something's up. Batman also notices that the closer he gets to the museum, the worse the weather gets. Rainy, windy, around the museum there might as well be a small hurricane. So he drives through this storm over to the museum loading dock. Batman enters the museum slowly. The lights are all out and an alarm is going off. It doesn't look like anyone's there, but as Batman's sneaking through the museum, he hears something. He can't see what's making the sound. Suddenly, the lights go on and we see that Batman is surrounded. By who, you ask? Well, here's the fun part of this movie. And this is what I would call my big change. Batman is surrounded by supervillains. And that's when Bruce realizes what's going on. The supervillains have teamed up. The Justice League shouldn't have formed to stop Steppenwolf. They should have formed to stop the Legion of Doom. For those who aren't aware, the Legion of Doom is the DC Comics villain supergroup. There really isn't an equivalent in Marvel. It would either be the Masters of Evil or the Brotherhood of Mutants, but both of those groups are kind of isolated to a single corner of the Marvel Comics universe. The Legion of Doom is not. Every major hero has a villain in the Legion. It is all the heavy hitters getting together. So that's this movie. In Superman's absence, the villains realize that if they work together, they can do whatever they want. There is no one to stop them. And I think this is a much stronger premise for this first Justice League movie. This is the perfect time for a less apocalyptic villain. Superman is dead. I think it's insane to kill him this early, but he's dead. So let's use that. Like, have the Justice League deal with the threat that Superman would easily neutralize. There are plenty of those, and they would all make great movies. Let's get that out of the way while Superman is dead, and then save the new gods for when Superman is resurrected. And spoiler alert, it's not in this movie. That's my really big change to the DCEU continuity. As great as it is that Superman gets to pose with the rest of the Justice League at the end of the movie, it is not worth bringing him back from the dead, especially one movie after he died. Since Justice League is pretty much a direct sequel to Batman v Superman, and DC clearly wants to catch up to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but this would be even better. In 10 years, they have done a lot, but the single thing that the 
Marvel movies haven't really done yet is the heroes fighting an organized group of different supervillains. It's a staple of comic book team-ups, and for some reason, Marvel hasn't touched it. If the Justice League antagonist was the Legion of Doom, DC would be beating Marvel to that idea. They're breaking new ground, kind of like how they beat Marvel to the first female superhero movie, if you don't count all the bad ones. And these Legionnaires are all small-time villains. I'm not planning to introduce characters that we expect to be the villain in a solo movie anytime soon. They're mostly characters with one simple gimmick who will make for a fun fight, and we never have to worry about them again. Or we can use them in the future as part of a larger team. So for now, we've got Deathstroke, the world's greatest assassin, Copperhead, snake-themed acrobat with poison, and Weather Wizard controls the weather. They call themselves the Legion, and Bruce already knows who these villains are. He's dealt with them before, so he knows how screwed he is. We also hear over the loudspeaker that a villain named Toy Man is controlling the automated systems in and around the museum. In this movie, Toy Man is a hacker, and he's the reason Batman doesn't know about the Legion. Toy Man wipes all of the footage of the Legion and keeps them off the grid. Batman asks the villains what they're doing with the artifacts, but they don't tell him. He notices that Deathstroke does have what appears to be an old book and identifies it as the Book of Ra. Now Batman is sure something's up. He tries to contact Alfred, but Toy Man is blocking the signal. Batman's on his own. A drone piloted by Toy Man flies in. It's Toy Man, so maybe it's a like toy helicopter or something. It takes the book from Deathstroke, and once it leaves, the doors lock, sealing Batman in with the other three villains. Now we get a fight between Batman and these three supervillains, and it's awesome. They all have different styles. Copperhead is acrobatic. She climbs walls with her claws and uses them to scratch and poison Batman. Deathstroke uses weapons. He has a bow staff, throwing stars, and a pair of katanas. Weather Wizard creates gusts of wind and shoots lightning at Batman using his staff. Batman is doing okay when it's one-on-one, -on -one, but every time it seems like Batman is gaining some ground, another villain knocks him back down. And right as Batman is all but done for, Toy Man makes an announcement through the loudspeaker that something is coming in fast. The villains are confused, but before they have any time to react, Wonder Woman bursts through the door. Cue that theme that I hate. So, this is my second big retcon. Wonder Woman can fly. In these movies, it's something that she used to be able to do, but when she took some time off from being a superhero, she got rusty. That's why she doesn't fly in BVS, outside of flying Turkish Airlines, of course. But this retcon will be really important in Act 2, so like, just put that in your back pocket. And she does work against these villains. Deathstroke does a good job fighting Diana hand-to-hand, -hand, and Weather Wizard's lightning doesn't hurt her, but it does distract her when she gets the better of Deathstroke. And while both of them are dealing with Wonder Woman, Batman takes on Copperhead. This fight will end when Deathstroke realizes that they can't beat Wonder Woman, and he uses an explosive to collapse the ceiling near where Batman and Copperhead are fighting. That forces Wonder Woman to let him go so that she can save Batman. Deathstroke and Weather Wizard escape, but Wonder Woman manages to lasso Copperhead. So this is what you call a lock-in. Things are different. The villains have formed the Legion, and Bruce can't fight them on his own. So then Diana and Bruce take Copperhead back to the Batcave to interrogate her. They search her for trackers and don't find any, and the cell is in a different part of the Batcave, so Copperhead can't learn any of Bruce's secrets. Diana uses the lasso of Hestia to compel Copperhead to tell the truth. Copperhead tells our heroes that the villains are working with Deathstroke. He's paying the villains to work together and steal four Egyptian artifacts. Copperhead doesn't know why Deathstroke wants them. She doesn't know that much at all. Like, they don't have a hideout. They just meet at the location for each crime. She also doesn't know which other villains are working with the Legion besides Deathstroke, Weather Wizard, and Toy Man. Although, she suspects that Clayface was also part of the plan, and there are definitely others. Copperhead also says that once he has all the artifacts, Deathstroke believes that the Legion will be unstoppable. Finally, Copperhead says that the final artifact the Legion is after is the Orb of Anubis in the Smithsonian National History Museum, and they're planning to steal it in a week. Then the good guys throw Copperhead back in her cell. Bruce says that he needs to figure out what Deathstroke is planning. Diana says that they need help. Bruce refuses. Alfred explains that he called Diana. Without her help, Bruce would be dead. Then Alfred reminds Bruce of all the good that he was able to do when Bruce was part of a team, alluding to working with Robin, and he needs to start trusting people again. Bruce reluctantly agrees to track down and help form the Justice League, and that is the end of Act 1. Batman has accepted the call. He has decided to cross through the threshold. In this case, the threshold is Bruce accepting that he cannot solve this problem on his own, and agreeing to seek help. Traditionally, the end of Act 1 is marked by a change in both character and location. The location will change. Bruce and Diana need to travel to where the other members of the Justice League are. Amnesty Bay for Aquaman, Metropolis for Cyborg, and Central City for The Flash. More importantly, Bruce is going from a place of order, being alone to a place that, to Bruce, 
Bruce is chaotic, working with people. He is stepping out of his comfort zone. Next up is Act 2, The Rise and Fall of the Justice League. So, thank you to everyone who continues to support the channel on Patreon. It's incredibly cool, and I really appreciate it. If you want to see your name up here, get an early look at videos, and other cool stuff, throw in a buck or two at patreon.com slash nandovmovies. It is by far the easiest way to get my undying gratitude. If you don't already listen to my podcast, give it a look. It's called Mostly Nitpicking. Every week, my co-host DJ and I analyze a pop culture thing by looking exclusively at the details. We've done every movie movie of the summer, and when there's downtime, we take suggestions. I made an Instagram account, not sure what it's for, but it'll be fun. Like every other thing, it's at Nando V Movies. Also, an intrepid Redditor created the Nando V Movies subreddit. If you use Reddit, subscribe to that. I'm on Reddit pretty frequently. It's a great place to just discuss movies, and also, sometimes people will write their own fixes for movies that are way better than mine. Subscribe to this channel, watch other videos, Patreon button again, and finally, for updates, on videos and other stuff. You can follow me on Facebook and Twitter. I'm at Nando V Movies. That's all I've got. I'll see you next time.